Hi, I'm Eric the Travel Guy. When you venture out into this country of ours, you will quickly discover just how vast it truly is. Today we're in Pennsylvania, one of our 13 original colonies and America's first big state. And sure, you may know Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, but we're headed off the interstate. So join me as we explore beyond your backyard in the Pennsylvania Great Outdoors region. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel. And I still do today. Airlines, hotels, cruises, new places, delicious food, I love all of it. And that's why I've been traveling the world professionally for more than a decade. But what troubles me these days is that Americans are leaving paid vacation time on the table each year at an alarming rate. Well, I want to help fix that. So please consider this a personal invitation to join me each week on my mission to get you traveling more than ever before. Because while the world is a pretty big place to explore, your next vacation is waiting to be discovered not just around the globe, but perhaps just around the corner. Let me introduce you to the places, people, and secrets I've discovered that remind me just how exciting it is to be alive and hopefully will inspire you to get out of the house and into your next great adventure. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Feel that? That's a crisp autumn breeze drifting off the Appalachian Mountains. And if you listen closely, you can hear the uninterrupted symphony of nature's soundtrack. Visually spectacular, yes. Boring, no. You know, once you're here, you'll quickly discover why so many people come here year after year after year. On today's episode, we're gonna show you a unique slice of Americana. From small towns to the land of the giants, roaming wild elk, artistic and culinary craftsmanship, and the most famous groundhog in these United States. Speaking of the U.S., here's our trusty map. The Pennsylvania Great Outdoors region is made up of five counties and the Cook Forest State Park in north central Pennsylvania. This is a big, beautiful part of the state, located about an hour's drive from Pittsburgh, and it's the perfect destination for family fun and outdoor adventure. Here you'll find the rolling Appalachian Mountains and more than a million acres of forest land, including the Allegheny National Forest, Cook Forest, and many state parks. Two mighty rivers cut across the landscape. Plus, there are fresh-filled lakes, scenic overlooks, and wildlife galore. Meander through the small towns, shop in the locally owned stores, and sample delicious rustic cuisine. But where did it all begin? How and why was this region put on the proverbial map? For those answers, we started our journey in the Lily of the Valley on Millionaire's Row in the town of Ridgeway with resident historian Bob Imhoff. Is there a name we should be Googling? We're going to hit the Google box. What, what should we type in? If, you, if you, you can Google Lily of the Valley National Historic District and the other is Ridgeway Heritage Council. Okay. There are a number of properties, there are a number of sites, and yes. this is a huge, what, what are the numbers here? The, the number of overall contributing properties yes. is 730. It is actually one of the largest national historic districts in the state of Pennsylvania. Are people building homes like this today? Very few. Most of the homes that you see like this are homes that have, like this one, have been restored. Much of the woodwork in almost all these homes was built right in this town. There is Hyde Murphy woodwork in the Library of Congress, in the Pentagon, in the Smithsonian Institution, as far away as the University of Hawaii. Funny, people will go and they will, as you said, get outdoors and, and look around. When, right. when they're outdoors, they're going to see trees. Now you're going to spend the night at a, you know, a bed and breakfast in, in one of these beautiful homes, perhaps. Mm -hmm. the, the wood that they're going to touch, that they're going to they're going to hold the handrail on the way up the stairs, the stairs themselves. Yes. That's where you just were today. Yes, that's right. It came out of those out of this forest, and in turn was turned into this magnificent millwork, as it's called, that embellished these gorgeous, gorgeous homes in this town. And that is part of the reason that, from a tourism point of view, why so many people come to Ridgeway. So you, if you're really into looking at architecture and fine craftsmanship and so on, that is a major draw to Ridgeway. We are roughly halfway between Toronto, Canada and Washington, D.C. Between 1890 and 1920, there were 36 millionaires lived in this town. Ridgeway was the richest per capita community in the state of Pennsylvania. And then with three railroad lines converging on Ridgeway, it became a hub. Right. for all this economic development. 
Why do vacation seekers, why do, why do people come and vacation here these days? Outdoor recreation, uh, you have a National Wild and Scenic River being the clarion, the rails to trails system. Tell me about chainsaws. Is there a festival? Yeah, the festival takes place. Uh, it's going to take place in April this year. They've kind of moved it a little bit further back. It's called the Ridgeway Chainsaw Carving Rendezvous. Why do they come here today? It, it, it certainly was. In the early years, it was the timber industry that brought people here to develop the, 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 the sawmills. Uh, it also became very, very noted for its wildlife, for hunting, fishing, and so on. When you add this community as an example with its wealth that was developed, because of the timber industry and associated industries. They, they now come here, spend time in the woods, the Allegheny National Forest, it's the only national forest in PA, which now encompasses about 518,000 acres of federally controlled land, mm -hmm. and then publicly owned areas such as state game lands and the Department of Conservation Natural Resources area, which are our state parks and state forests. What makes this geographic region so important to the story of America? Historically, uh, this area of, Pencil of North Central Pennsylvania was noted uh, for its very dense conifer forests, which uh, if you go back to the, the late 1700s, uh, Jacob Ridgway, who was a Philadelphia shipbuilder, he, he bought approximately 120,000 acres of this land up in this part of Pennsylvania because of the white pine stands that were here. Okay. Uh, white pine he needed for building ship masts, ship decking, and so on. What is a timber baron? Well, timber baron ended up being one of the people that purchased this land throughout most of Pennsylvania. They would send in groups of, of uh, jobbers, as they were called in those days, to cut so many acres of, of timber. There were no railroads. No, uh, obviously there were no roads, but even no railroads. No. Prior to 1864, whatever, depending on it was. Was life hard? back then, but I'm also interested to find out, did they think it was hard? The people knew that the opportunity that they had when they came here was in several respects going to be very, very difficult and very challenging, but in many respects as immigrants, it was far better than what they had back in the old country. This town, Ridgeway as an example, was a melting pot of different nationalities that came here from Sweden, Scotland, Ireland, England, Wales. Germany, the Swedes and the people from the, the Scandinavian countries brought the, the tradition of lumbering from, from Europe here to this country. The Italians that came here eventually, they were very, very famous for their masonry work, stonework and so on. Sure. So each of the individual uh, groups of people that came here uh, brought a, a specific tradition from their, their home countries. Was it a better life that they built? Um, it was. Uh, was it challenging? Absolutely. It was very difficult. This was survival just based upon your on hard back-breaking work mm -hmm. to, to clear a, a what was mostly a, a, a conifer you know, forest. After my fascinating discussion with Bob, I dropped in on the historic straw brewery in the nearby town of St. Mary's and took a tour with brewmaster Vince Aceta. You too can take a free small group guided tour as long as you make a reservation. On my visit, I learned how this brewery has been crafting award-winning beers since the late 1870s, and I also discovered the Straub Eternal Tap. And what's this Eternal Tap I've been hearing a lot ah. about since we got here? It's been a tradition of hospitality at the brewery for as long as anyone can remember, and we've always had a, uh, a tap, a beer tap here. You can actually see some, there's some old pictures of different earlier versions of it, but we've always had just a, a spirit of hospitality where visitors uh, could come in, have a couple of beers, enjoy it, talk with friends, and then just all we ask is you wash your glass. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we sampled all the flavors, and after a light lunch at Gunner's, uh, that's the Savage Burger Challenge, and no, I didn't even come close to finishing it, we made our way to the other side of Elk County to see, well, you guessed it, elk. Elk in Cameron counties are home to the largest wild elk herd in the northeastern United States. Nearly a thousand of these amazing creatures roam free in the Benazet area. That's where you'll find the Elk Country Visitor Center a premier elk viewing and conservation education facility with a 4D theater, interactive exhibits, discovery room, live forest cams, and horse-drawn wagon rides. 
Visitors from all over the world come here to see these animals in their natural habitat. I took that horse-drawn wagon ride to get as close as one can to these large animals. After my scenic tour, I roamed into the visitor center. It's a pretty remarkable structure, and I needed to pick up a few souvenirs for the kids. And me. Have you ever been in a situation where someone honestly suggested you need a vacation? You know, maybe you're working too hard. Maybe too many emails, too many lattes, too many selfies on Facebook, whatever it is. Maybe you yourself thought, hmm, maybe I need to get away. Well, before we go any further, let me introduce you to the Gateway Lodge in Cook Forest. Nestled among the hemlock and pine of Pennsylvania's Cook Forest lies a grand getaway destination with the intimate feel of a bed and breakfast. Relax in the comfort of a perfectly appointed guest room or suite with a gas fireplace and fireside jacuzzi or one of their new rustic cabins along the river. Receive a spa treatment and be sure to take part in the farm to forest feast of your senses in their dining room. During the day, feel that stress slip away as you explore Cook Forest. That's where we met up with Dale Lutheringer. All right, first time visitor, can you give us the top three tips? What would you say to somebody who's never been here? First thing you gotta do is you gotta, you gotta experience the old growth forest. Walk the Long Willow Trail, you, you won't be disappointed. You gotta go to Seneca Point and Fire Tower. Then you need to experience the National Wild and Scenic Clarion River. So uh, grab a kayak or a canoe, or just drive your car along it. Get, go there in the morning, you get to see uh, deer, bald eagles, osprey. You just never know what you're gonna see. Why do people come today? When they get back in here and they start to be able to experience the forest, it's one of the best places to come in the eastern United States to see and experience old growth forest. People don't realize how big this forest is too. Well, we've got around 8,000 acres of state park land. And within that, we're looking at over 2,200 acres of old growth forest. Well, let's talk types of trees. I mean, pine comes to mind, Longfellow pine, did I get that right? That's what we call it, it's a white pine. Okay. And it's the tallest known tree north of the Smoky Mountains. It was 184 and a half feet tall. Oh my gosh. And uh, absolutely incredible tree. We have many record height tall trees mm -hmm. in Cook Forest. So we have the tallest known white pine in the Northeast, the tallest known hemlock in the Northeast, tallest known black cherry in the Northeast. Wow. All right, now let's talk old growth for just a moment. No, we're not talking about my mother-in-law. Hello. But let's talk about that for just a second. What makes this forest so unique and so special? These are the old forest trees that started growing here in around the mid 1600s. Uh, some of them started to grow not long after Christopher Columbus landed in the New World. No kidding. So yeah, we've got a lot of uh, old trees, a lot of record trees in terms of height and girth, dead standing trees, dead down trees, uh, a multi canopy layer, so you have different height classes of trees. Let's talk wildlife. What are we gonna see while we're here? Lots of good opportunity to see lots of deer. We do have good, healthy black bear population. A lot of people come here to cook forest to, uh, to bird. Mm -hmm. We do have some oddball critters that people don't often get to see with uh, Fisher, which is in the weasel family. Tell me what went on in this part of the forest. I mean, our nation was founded in 1776 and, these, and most of these trees were already here 100 years before that, so they saw that time period. If we could stand in one place for centuries, what we would see, what would we see? Right. Well, there's lots of annual events that take place in and around. Some of your favorites, what would you recommend? My favorites are our annual French and Indian War encampment that we hold here at the park. We have several hundred reenactors, thousands and thousands of people. It's a two-day event, so we've got several battles that we do in the woods, in the old growth forest. There's many different educational uh, programs going on through that weekend. We, we rope off an area, and it's every, everybody's behind the safety line, and all the action happens around you. Sometimes it moves through the line. Okay, well, we better wrap it up. <laughs> okay. yeah. Good to meet you. Thank you. After my visit with Dale, it was time to unlock another mystery here in Pennsylvania's great outdoors region. And that mystery has to do with one of the oldest professions in the world. I'm talking about moonshine production. Just outside the quaint little town of Brookville is Blackbird Distillery, where the owners, Jennifer and David Black, we're ready to show us how they make their incredibly popular elixir. What is moonshine? It's when they made illegal whiskey under the light of the moon. Corn whiskey is what real moonshine is. Other people make moonshines with potato, different, different sources, but corn is how real moonshine is made. And it started in Washington, PA. I don't know if you knew that, but that's where it originated. It did not start in West Virginia, Tennessee, or Kentucky. I hate to tell you, but it didn't. <laughs> My brother-in-law is going to be so upset to hear this news. During the Whiskey Rebellion, then it moved out of the other states, but it all originated in Washington, PA. What's in it? 
My husband makes it all by hand. That's how moonshine was made. So we have no machines here. We're the only distillery in the world that actually makes real moonshine with no machines from start to finish. That includes bottling it, labeling it, everything. Wasn't it illegal to make the, I mean, what, help, we're not, help me through the- Is this going on TV? Oh, no. <laughs> we're not really legal. No, we are legal. Yeah, we have a license. Of course. Yes, yes, but they started in Pennsylvania opening up licenses a couple years ago. So we're the second license in the state. So how do you drink? That's another thing. I, you know, cause you I drink it right the... down the hatchet, just <laughs> put it in a glass. And Again, just... we're back to my brother-in-law. That's what he does. He drinks it around and he's like, oh, it's got, it's the great, and he, and he talks how great it is. It's the greatest. I'm well, not sure it is. Well, like, some of it, he's probably talking, a lot of it's a straight. It tastes like turpentine. Yes. That's like our high test. Our high test, it catches, I mean, you can light it on fire. It took Shane's nail polish. It works here right off of her hand. <laughs> I don't drink any of that, okay? So we do natural flavors, but people cut it with Sprite, ginger ale. We have our own drink mixes here, but you can cut it with anything or drink it cold on ice and just sip it. Got it. How about the flavors? What, what kind of flavors? Well, we got 20 flavors. First, we have... Yeah, we got apple black. That's our signature shine. It's moonshine with a natural apple flavor. Then there's apple pie. And everybody's like, ooh, I had apple pie. And I always say, do you ever have ours? Because it's different, because it's made with corn base. And then we have what's called a hot cinnamon. Then we have an American, which is kind of like a bourbon. On my label, it says chard oak. Then we have blackbird straight. Then we have chocolate strawberry, chocolate banana, orange, green sickle, peach, pineapple, banana, lemon drop, root beer, black cherry, blueberry, blackberry, strawberry, pumpkin spice, and salt of watermelon. Give me a dollar, I'll do that backwards. <laughs> I think we have a dollar. Anybody have a dollar on this? No, no. Should we try some? Yes, you're allowed to have three. That's the law in Pennsylvania. We're allowed to give one and a half ounces per person per day. Even if moonshine isn't your thing, visitors marvel at the art of taking raw ingredients in a unique way and creating something special, much like the good folks at BWP Bats in Reynoldsville. Have you ever wondered how they make those authentic wooden bats for Major League Baseball? Well, to answer that question, you have to come here. They start with specially selected mature trees from Western Pennsylvania. Every bat is made in their factory and it follows a rigid 14 step quality control process to ensure you get what you deserve each and every time. So the bottom line, fans, they go to Cooperstown. Super fans, they come here. This is BWP. Oh, that's cool. Hey, I'm one of them. Earlier I mentioned charming little towns, and you'll certainly find plenty of them here in the region. We made our way to Jefferson County, where we discovered towns like Brockway, Brookville, which is where we are today. But we also decided to spend time in Punxsutawney. I'm not sure who's more excited about this interview, my eight-year-old and five-year-old daughters, or me. I think it's me. <laughs> I, I do, I really do. This is Punxsutawney Phil. We are in the weather capital of the world. This is him. This is not a stand-in. No, this enough. is actually Punxsy Phil. And, and what does he do on the other 363, four days out of the year? He makes appearances. Uh, he's gone to sporting events, uh, schools, libraries. We're constantly on the go with him. And he, he's got a pretty good record. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, he hundred percent, hundred percent, right? He calls Never it every wrong. time, yeah. right? If you don't mind me asking, how did all of this get started? We've been doing this since the late 1800s, right? Yeah, it's actually from an old. It comes from a German tradition, uh, candle must stay and uh, hedgehogs, and there's all kinds of things that even dates back to the Romans. But uh, a group of hunters back in 1886 is when the first recorded, they used to go on groundhog hunts around here. Got it. And uh, they had gone back for lunch and one of them noticed a groundhog coming towards them. And he raised up and just couldn't pull the trigger because there was an aura about him. And uh, that was Punxy Phil, so. 133 years ago. Yeah, well, he looks pretty good. Well, I don't think he's he said any work done, right? I think he hasn't had any work done, has he? No. no. This is it. No. A little gray, you know. Does he talk throughout the year or only on Groundhog Day? So the only one that can talk to him is the president of the club. And while he's never, he's not prone to error, our president is at times. And he doesn't actually talk. Our, okay. uh, yeah, there's a little confusion yeah. in the research here, so yeah. help me out with this. Well, the president, through the uh, an acacia wood cane that he has, mm -hmm. can interpret his clicks and chatters and whistles, and so he knows what he's uh, saying through that. What is one of his favorite foods? Well, it's something they wouldn't normally eat, but these guys love, which is bananas. No kidding. Yeah. Seems to be pretty popular, though. 
do, do people, can people pet it? Can I pet him? Or no? We're licensed by the USDA. Got and it. because he's a wild animal, there are only, AJ and I are the only ones that are actually given permission, permission to do it. But I can pet AJ. You yeah. can pet AJ all you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But alas, Phil had a previous engagement and he was on to his next big media interview. For me, it was time to get back to nature. How you choose to get in touch with nature is really up to you. And frankly, you expand your comfort zone by trying new things. A nature walk, hiking, mountain climbing, fishing. The possibilities here in these five counties is seemingly endless. I did play golf earlier today at the Foxburg Country Club. That's the oldest golf course in continuous use in America. And after, I decided I needed a little quiet reflection to ponder why I even bother with that ever so frustrating game in the first place. A scenic boat ride down the Allegheny River is just what I needed. Maybe I'll take up bowling or attend a festival. I smell a segue. Each fall in Clarion County, in the town of Clarion, you can take part in the Autumn Leaf Festival. This nine-day international award-winning festival attracts more than 500,000 people to the area. Events and entertainment include carnival rides, amusements, and plenty to keep the whole family busy. I also made a cultural stop at Lincoln Hall and discovered a very rare and simply amazing Wurlitzer organ. Now, when I think Wurlitzer, you know, I, I mm. think of Lawrence Welk. I, I think of an accordion. Mm. I just do. It's my sure. ignorance coming out right here <laughs> on this interview. But we have to talk about this amazing piece of work behind us because it's a piece of art. It is. It's both that with its beautiful French council, but it also is one of only 24 of this kind of Wurlitzer organ that was created. It was originally created in 1929. It was in the Uptown Theater in Cleveland. Okay. And it was painstakingly refurbished over 11 years by an engineer, Paul McKissick. When he finished his labor of love, mm -hmm. he installed it in a garage oh. in Lake Latonka. As you do, I mean, You put sure. it in a garage. That's where your and invite, and invite your friends, come on in and hear my work. <laughs> and they did benefits, and Dr. Arthur Steffi attended a concert and said, this is the organ we need for Lincoln Hall. For here. And uh, so that was when the Arts Council was first created, and that was in 2005. Uh, and the first concert was in 2006. And the beauty about this hall, as you saw, is that these chairs, which point to the wonderful proscenium arch stage with the beautiful Steinway, also get turned around to be able to be looking right at this marvelous instrument. And there aren't too many of these in the world, no, in the United States, yes. but there aren't too many people who play these well. Because this is also, I have to, it's, is it a church organ, is it a theater organ? Mm. How do you, what's the classification? Well, there are pipes and there's 17 ranks of pipes, but it isn't in comparison to the extraordinary huge pipe organs in churches. On the other hand, it is played normally by a very special cadre of theater organists. We've had uh, probably around 12 to 15 of the finest theater organists in the world play here. They travel around this country preserving this art form. David Wickerham is someone who at intermission of a concert will take requests from everything from Pink Panther to Star Wars, and then for the entire second half, he puts them all together. So they have all of them an improvisatory genius, which is pretty uh, much the same also with pipe organists, but it's a very special genre, and we're honored to have this here and so grateful to McKissick and Steffi for making it possible. I want to talk about the Red Brick Gallery just for a second here mm -hmm. because it's a labor of love of yours as well. What can we expect to find when we go in? The Red Brick Gallery is extraordinary because it represents the kind of volunteerism that we have here in Foxburg, and really, I would say, in Western Pennsylvania. A very unique woman, Donna Edmonds, uh, retired to this beautiful valley, and so she has gathered an assemblage of marvelous artists from the larger region who actually come and work at the gallery doing ours, and they have on the first floor a gift shop, sure. and the second floor houses exhibits what are some tips you can help families include the arts as part of the trip? There needs to be time, even in a very active vacation, for reflection. Mm -hmm. And the arts always offer that. And so if you can go into an art gallery between going down the river or taking right. a wonderful Segway ride at Riverstone Estate, which right. one can do here, and go, can go in and see the artists and view their observations of nature and many of the beautiful landscapes, um, that kind of time is great. And it's great for families. The arts are a way to plan a vacation. 
what's coming up? Is there a festival? Is there a great concert I'd like to attend? And then our concerts are every two weeks here. Wow. And um, hopefully people coming here will take a look at what's playing while I'm there and how can I work my entire vacation to be in Foxburg at Lincoln Hall. <laughs> To be clear, we certainly could spend a full week here in Pennsylvania's great outdoors region because there's something special about keeping it simple. I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Thank you for exploring Beyond Your Backyard. So it's not just big trees, there's little big trees as well. So. Yeah. Incidentally, that was the name of my rock group in college, Little Big Tree. I didn't know <laughs> the scale makes me look fat. <laughs> Kevin is going to wrestle that 700-pound elk. He just doesn't know it yet. Neither does the elk. <laughs>